Dr. Ken Lindemann is, is a great example of a local boy makes good. He is intimately familiar with our coastal and marine ecosystems ecosystems having lived in three Treasure Coast counties that border the Indian River Lagoon. His PhD is from the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmosphere Sciences at the University of Miami. He is now a professor at Florida Tech in the Department of Ocean Engineering and Marine Sciences. He is the program manager for FIT's program in sustainability, he is widely published in research and policy journals, and has co-authored books on marine ecology, coastal management, and sustainability. Without a doubt, we can say he is dedicated to education with a deep recognition of the fierce urgency of now. He is ably using his platform to involve his students in what Thomas Berry has called the great work of our time. And he is here today to make a broader impact to get us where we need to go, which is understanding the challenges that are upon us due to climate change. Thank you. Dr. Newman. Welcome. Uh, the, the title to try to provide structure to this is Changing Climate, Changing Oceans. I'm going to hierarchically, in a structured manner, go through an immense array of topics. This is the third talk in a series of these talks down the Indian River Lagoon. So to set the scene at the macro-regional scale, uh, you know, the southern United States is often considered to be part of the greater Caribbean. We have uh, the tremendous array of tropical and subtropical species down here in South Florida. And the Treasure Coast and Space Coast, where I'm from, you see a really interesting transition where the tropical species are overlapping <coughs> what are called the temperate warm Carolinian species. So we have this extraordinary biodiversity here. We have you know, Jupiter Inlet, where I grew up, and on, in the summer, you can see newly settled butterfly fishes. It's, it's a very reefy system. By the time you get up to you know, New Smyrna, Cape Canaveral, you see a lot of the temperate species. There's over 35 countries in this overall region, but we share something with them, and that is at least in southeast and east central Florida, we have the last remnants of the tropical fauna and the subtropical fauna. Uh, of course, many of these countries depend on fisheries and coastal uh, tourism-based economies. Um, billions of dollars in annual services provided by coastal resources. Here in uh, this, the, the neck of the woods we're looking at, this is uh, Fort Pierce, Google Earth, uh, Port St. Lucie. The push pin is this library, so that's where we are. Stewart, St. Lucie River System. I was fortunate to live in Jupiter. I grew up in part in Jupiter as a high school kid when Jupiter was very different from now. And let me tell you now, Stewart, Fort Pierce were very different from now. Port St. Lucie did not exist. Um, I encourage you, if, if, if that looks dense, it is dense. The level of development in Port St. Lucie down is extraordinary. Okay, I encourage you to Google Earth this phenomenal. You can put it on your desktop for free. You can zoom in and really look around here. It's a great way to really look at what's left of your watershed. Uh, just a, a quick comment here. You know, these, the remaining green areas are very important areas. <coughs> So, three main components today. Climate change in the oceans, kind of a science 101, 301, a little 501, but it ought to be okay. Uh, then we're gonna talk about impacts, and then to oceans and fisheries, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what we can do. Importantly, uh, I'm an optimist. Those who know me know that I can, I can unpack things that don't look particularly pleasing, but I, I am an optimist, and, and I think that we need to stay focused on solutions, know the problems, but lever what we know to getting to solutions. It's America. We fix things. We don't deny things. We, we, we recognize the science, and we fix things. So some quick things about the sciences of climate change, and this is a very important, if this is a plural thing, okay? Um, climate change, most of the science, not all of it by any means, but most of it involves a whole field of many sciences called geophysics, or the geophysical sciences. Maybe you've had the pleasure and the delight 
to have a meteorologist in your life or a physical oceanographer, or maybe a paleo meteorologist or a paleogeologist. Okay? These are very challenging disciplines. The people who do this are not doing it to get rich. They're doing it because they got the science bug early and they, many of them slaved through grad school to attain you know, high levels of training in very challenging disciplines. So when people are saying that, you know, a good question is when someone's telling you why all the climate science is wrong is, you know, politely, and good sir, what is your background in geophysics? <laughs> um, liquid and air behave, by the way, and this is one of the things that you might have taken out of high school, a lot of people didn't. You know, liquid, as an example of how challenging this is, guys, liquid and air, Air behaves physically as fluids, FYI. Air is a fluid. The atmosphere is a fluid, just like the ocean. So it flows like a liquid, but it's the atmosphere. There's a lot of stuff to this geophysics. Okay? Many of these things are bouncing off of each other and 20 other sciences I could put up here in nonlinear ways. They're hard to predict. They don't go like this over time. They go like this over time. If you don't do this for a living, it can be very confusing. Uh, they also code vary. So a change in thing A can change thing B in hard to predict ways. Okay? So when you're doing climate science and things are complex, that's not a reason to reject it. It's a reason to pay careful attention. There's a lot of things going on. You have to be very careful and thoughtful, and you have to recognize many, many things co -bear. They depend on each other. A really useful website to, to come into this is climate.nasa.gov. Just search NASA Climate. Uh, you know, the crazies at NASA, right? Um, one of the nice things about it is they have all these real-time measurements of key indicators of changing climate parameters, carbon dioxide, global temperature, Arctic ice. You click these little tabs here and you go to the metadata. You can unpack the data. It's NASA. They have all these wonderful geeks and cubicles um, who are, geek is a high compliment. <laughs> who, who are maintaining this still. Let me ask you, some of you might know, are these new numbers or kind of old numbers? These numbers are kind of old. Uh, this is from about four or five years ago. Carbon dioxide PPM there is 405. It's almost 415 now. All these numbers are going up. Um, <clears throat> with the exception of these two, Arctic ice and land ice, which is a real issue with sea level rise, especially land ice. So one other thing on this wonderful website is if you click the facts tab, you get a drop down and then there's a thing called scientific consensus. So some, you know, somebody there did a really valuable thing for society that is completely ignored. And what they did is they went to the websites of many of the major scientific organizations, not only in the country, but the world. And they put together the position statements that their boards put together on this issue of climate change in the last 15 or 20 years. And uh, it's going to be difficult to read these, but I've got an analog version of this I'll hand out in a minute, or I'll get started for those that are interested. But most importantly, even than what they're saying, because what they're saying boils down to three things. Uh, the world is getting warmer. It's largely caused by human activities uh, post-industrial revolution. And the consequences are already here and are going to amplify. Okay? Those three things are not in debate in the scientific community. There are hundreds of websites that will tell you that those positions are wrong. Hundreds. Wrong? A dozen of which look kind of legit. You might not have heard about AAAS, but this is like one of the most prestigious organizations in the world. Let's talk about something you might have heard of. You might have heard of the American Freaking Chemical Society, the good people that brought you plastic. <laughs> okay? They're on board with this. <clears throat> okay? The American Geophysical Union. Remember the geophysics I mentioned? Uh, there's like 70,000 members of this, a uh, hundred year history. Um, 
the American Medical Association. The public health consequences of this have been present for years. Uh, well, that isn't working for you, I understand. Maybe the American Meteorology Society. Okay, now, you say, oh, well, those are just names. of These organizations, to be a fellow or to be on the board of one of these organizations, you have to be at the highest level of achievement as a scientist. The boards of directors that generated this statement are not populated by environmentalists or conservationists. A lot of those guys run from that term. They're trying to stay away from that term because they're already getting beaten over the head for taking positions on this. They're career conservative scientists. To succeed as a scientist, you don't do it by being radical. You do it by being very conservative and, and, and careful in what you do. Okay, it's just something that's worth pointing out. And for those of you who like, um, are interested in this, I'm gonna send these around. Keep them, spread them around, please. You don't have to take one. It has a little more detail on this. The website, right here. The slideshow and the video of this will be available as soon as we can. All right, why are these organizations concerned? Oh, this is also what I just showed you for the United States. Same thing for the great ancient scientific societies in Europe. The British, uh, various British societies. The same thing for the scientific societies in Asia, okay? South America. Why are they concerned? Uh, Global carbon input since 1850. This is from a federal data clearinghouse. You can look it up. This is not Greenpeace. This is not the Sierra Club. Hats <laughs> off to them. This is a US Federal Department of Energy, I believe, data clearing center. And so what you see is that uh, when the Industrial Revolution, by the way, you'll often hear, well, you're, you're anti-technology. No, I love air conditioning. <laughs> I'm going to really love it in three months. I love ice. Do you know what a breakthrough was when wonderful engineers created machinery that could generate ice for people who weren't rich? You know, ice was the rich man's thing from quite recently. So I'm pro-industrial revolution. Yeah. Burn things, build things. What people didn't know is that we're releasing these greenhouse gases we're going to talk about, and carbon is a primary one. And so inputs have grown steadily. And then in about you know, 1950, 55, some of, the, some of us might have been around in the 50s, uh, it really started to go from a relatively linear flat, not flat, but a relatively linear relationship to something that began to show tendencies towards becoming multiplicative. Very huge increases from different sources in 55. What's interesting is, for example, in 55, we had about 2,000 million metric tons of carbon per year going into the atmosphere. 2,000 million. What's that? 2,000 million, there's a shorter way to say that. You got two billion? Two billion? Okay, so six zeros with that onto the three zeros there, that's two billion. Okay, we were there at 1955. Interestingly, by you know, the 1990s, the early 1990s, we had increased that threefold and we're at six billion annual going into the atmosphere. The problem, by the way, is, and I think some of you know that, you know this, is that it doesn't leave the atmosphere once you put it in there fast. It has resonance times. That can be over 100 years. Now we're looking at another four billion annual added by uh, early 2020s. Okay. That's what we're dealing with. There's no debate about this outside of a bunch of very clever websites that'll tell you it's all wrong. But the, there's even cleverer websites run by professional scientists and their organizations. Okay. You're getting amplifying feedback here now. Things are getting faster and faster. So greenhouse gases, known as GHGs, they trap extra heat in the atmosphere.
creating a greenhouse effect, which you guys are familiar with greenhouses. You're familiar with a car in a parking lot in the summer. Is, it, is the heat content of that car different after you go to Publix if you left the window down versus up? The atmosphere, the windows are up. There's some permeability, but with these greenhouse gases, it's, uh, there's a long residence time. So primary GHGs, there are a variety, include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, yes, water, others. Some has, have residence times of approximately 110 to 120 years. A molecule is going to be in the atmosphere, the ocean, uh, potentially that long. Uh, there are many chemical uh, dynamics that can change that molecule over time, yes. Um, methane. Fortunately, it's only in the atmosphere for about 15 years, but the, anybody know about methane? It's, it, it traps heat like 20 to 30 times uh, more than the same volume of CO2. So the methane is a real issue as well. This traps heat because the atmosphere balance shifts more in, uh, sorry, I have an, an editorial uh, I have some editing to do there. The bottom line here is that we're out of balance. We're putting in all of this new carbon in the form of CO2, methane, and it doesn't leave at the same rate that it goes in. We're stuck with it for huge amounts of time. CO2 alone, over 40 million tons now going in annually. And I've heard this, I've worked in the nonprofit community since the late 1980s. I've heard this many times during meetings with scientists and policy experts. Wouldn't it be something if we could see the CO2? But we typically can't. What you're seeing here are particulates, largely. So the annual rate of increase in atmospheric CO2 over the past 60 years is about 100 times faster than previous natural increases, such as those at the end of the last ice age. A common thing is that people say, well, it was hot before and sea level was higher before. That's great. That's informative. That doesn't disprove anything we're talking about. Okay. The last time the atmospheric CO2 was this high was approximately 3 million years ago when temperature was three and a half to five and a half Fahrenheit degrees higher than the pre-industrial era, and sea level was markedly higher than now. This is a very important figure, so there's a couple of important figures coming, guys. All right. X-axis years, it goes to 400,000. 400,000 years ago to today, this was as of 2013, from those crazies at NASA. Okay, and notice they went ahead and put in a line here for 650,000 years. In this example, atmospheric CO2 has never been above this line. CO2 is measured by parts per million, so we talk a lot about ppm. So 300 parts per million, a global average of CO2 concentration wasn't exceeded for 500 to 800,000 years more by some estimates. Look what happened in 1950. 70 years, 80 years after we started to see that blip in, in, in carbon release post uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Over a period of more than 800,000 years now, global CO2 concentrations for the first time went over 300 ppm in 1950. Folks, they're now at 410 to 415 ppm. That is the global CO2 concentration right now. What that means is, 1950, this is as of July 2013. So look at the 2013 uh, parts per million of CO2. It's, it's a little bit below 400 parts per million. That was only, guys, you know, what, 13, seven years ago. So, here it is now. That's where it was in 2013. It was below there for the prior 800,000 years. I drove by a shopping center in Satellite Beach where I live uh, right before Christmas, and I, I, I 
a great Christmas present. There was a bunch of people out there with signs. And one of the signs said, on a Saturday afternoon, I'm just driving to the beach thinking about maybe surfing. One of the signs says, we need more CO2. <laughs> <laughs> you hear this all the time. People will break down and deconstruct all of this and then just wave it off. By the way, it's good for plants. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, so we're now at about 415 parts per million. Congratulations. It's going up about two to three parts per million every year. For you youngsters here, um, you're going to see uh, PPMs of CO2 by the time you're 60, 70 years old. They're going to, are going to be off the chart. Um, <coughs> Charts over 450 parts per million. And the thing about that is, remember the whole greenhouse effect thing, is, is that this correlates with heat in the atmosphere and in the oceans around the planet. Okay. The higher the PPM, the higher the air temperature, the higher the water temperatures. So, very important connection there. And we've had about a two degree Fahrenheit rise in atmospheric temperature since 1880. So those people saying we need more CO2, they're saying we need it to get hotter, faster. Okay. So the five warmest years in the record from 1880 to 2019 have occurred since 2015. To make it hotter. Um, nine of the ten warmest years have occurred since 05. Uh, in 80, New heat records were set about every thir 13 and a half years. Now they're set about every three years. Wow. Uh, these, these are from climate.gov. OK. The ocean heat sink. You might have, in high school, I know all you guys remember your high school chemistry. <laughs> yeah. um, remember learning about water? Water is an amazing thing. You know, we wouldn't have any of this without water. Uh, it's a heat sink. 80% of the heat, 90% of the heat trapped by GHG since the 1950s is stored in the oceans rather than air. <laughs> so these indicators decrease in a warming world. These indicators increase in a warming world. But what we've learned is that this doesn't work. We're increasingly in a, a, a data irrelevant political system. So like many scientists, what I've been trying to do in the last 10 years is to not do what I learned to do, which is Impact things in great detail. But so NOAA, which and NASA, which gave us these wonderful things, you know what they're giving us now? 22 years too late, but I don't blame them. They're giving us cartoons. When you are talking with folks about this, KISS method. Remember the KISS method? Keep it simple. And keep it simple, stupid. Right? You, you, you have to talk in simple, careful ways. Dummy it down. <laughs> it, it, yeah, but, but it's, I don't want to use value judgments here because they're not <laughs> trained. You know, these folks aren't trained in nonlinear geophysical dynamics. They're being told things that sound really powerful and scary about the science. What's happening, guys, with climate in the last 30 years is that entire knowledge structures that have carried the planet into the Industrial Revolution and beyond are being eroded away from the roots by this. So whether it's cartoons or the data, we have to get folks to understand. So let's talk more specifically about our oceans and our estuaries <coughs> and our changing climate. So I'm going to show a lot of information. I'm going to try to accelerate a little bit. Uh, the, this presentation will be available. Uh, and I wanted to, I'm an I'm a information geek. 
And I wanted to provide some of the citations for the information that's going to follow by geographic scale. I wanted to also acknowledge that I have spent you know, 30, 40 years learning a lot of things about the ocean, not by talking to scientists only, but by talking to fisher folk, uh, fishermen, fisherwomen, surfers, divers. 20 other technical references are at the end. So we're going to break this down into five categories. We're going to start with heating. Then we're going to talk about these issues here, extreme weather, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and very importantly, what's often left out are surprises. Okay. Um, these things co-vary. This isn't its own box. This isn't its own box. This you can break down and unpack, but it also influences all kinds of things here, right? Okay? So, and, and that of course spills into that, et cetera. So ocean and estuary heating, you know, we focus typically more on increases in air temperature and pay less attention to increasing ocean heat content and ocean temperatures, right? If you, when you think about climate change, you think about warming, you think about air temperature. Um, you saw what I said earlier, what I showed earlier, 90% of the heat since 1950 trapped by GHGs is in the flipping oceans. The oceans are just sucking this up. People talk about the ticking time bomb in the ocean. Oh yeah, I mentioned that. I like to mention it three or four times because <laughs> I've learned from being a teacher, you know, you don't want to be repetitious, but the reality is if your repetition is clever and they don't know they're being repeated to too much, repetition can equal retention. Parents might know about that, right? <laughs> you never figured that out entirely right. Um, so, Higher temperatures. You hear the phrase a lot, ocean heat content. <coughs> okay. Um, hotter water. It ain't just at the surface, by the way. There's a lot of very interesting vertical profile dynamics with heat distribution in the new oceans. We're going to talk about these <coughs> features of higher temperatures in our oceans and estuaries. Okay, I'm going to go through these in order. Sound good? Okay. This ought to be something that some of you folks are familiar with. Increasing ocean and estuary heat content. Warmer waters mean less oxygen in the water. You might have learned that in a high school chemistry class. If you heat water, less oxygen is available to organisms in that water. Um, warmer water means faster algae growth. We're, guess what we're talking about right now? We're talking about where we all feel the pain. And that's what's been happening to the IRL. You guys had your explosive challenges down here on the southern IRL. We had them up in the northern IRL as well. A little different, similar structure. A times B, with too many nutrients from too much fertilizer washing into the lagoon too often, equals algal blooms, which equal fish kills. The hotter the oceans get, the hotter the atmosphere gets, the higher the chances of algal blooms and fish kills. There's a big literature on this. I'm not making this up because it, it, it seems to make sense and I want it to be like that. There's a big scientific literature on this. Okay? And, and it, this is one of those things in the scientific literature that's pretty, pretty logical. It's not counterintuitive like a lot of other things. Seagrasses, uh, well, yeah, seagrasses are really interesting things. They are underwater flowering plants. They're underwater flowering plants. They're very complex arrays of physical and biological environmental variables that they're managing. Uh, in a re major review by Fred Short and a team fairly recently, uh, some of the conclusions were Hotter water influences seagrass physiological and ecological processes, including growth, reproduction, and distribution. Um, I could give it a, a 60 minutes just on this. Okay. 
Higher temperatures increase extreme weather events that affect seagrass. E example, uh, high volume rain events, which create higher pulses of runoff, sedimentation, and turbidity. Locally reduced salinity, which can be offset by rising sea levels, and that's very localized. The point is that climate change impacts on seagrasses and many types of marine vegetation are very complex and currently not very well understood. Laboratories around the world are, are throwing huge resource, resources relative uh, to in the last 10 years to this now as a topic. 